Amen. All right. Tonight, go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And tonight, we are going to look at a parable in the Bible. And I have, in the past, I have talked about this parable. Um, I have referred to uh, the real meaning of this parable, but I never really preached a whole message on it. And that's the parable of what we would call the prodigal son. But really, um, I think when we talk about the parable of the prodigal son, I think we should probably call it the parable of two sons. Uh, the only problem with that, there's another parable of two sons we're going to look at. But um, whenever you look at parables in the Bible, okay, one thing that we often forget to do is go back and look at why Jesus told that parable. And we often miss the real message. And the real message of the parable of the prodigal son is not necessarily the prodigal son and this morning the the message i preach i showed the parable of the unju- of the steward okay and even that parable while i gave you all bible principles that we can learn from that parable the primary application of that parable was not what i preached about and it actually goes along with what i'm going to be preaching about tonight so tonight we're going to look at the parable of the prodigal son and you're gonna, I think you're going to hear it probably the way you've never heard it before. But I'm telling you, I'm going to give you plenty of proof. This is what we are supposed to get from this parable. So let's start reading in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And it says, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he had came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son, make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder brother was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house and heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And I'm going to show you tonight this parable. This is one you've heard it a million times. You've heard a zillion messages on this. And you know, I'm just going to admit, this is one of these passages. I've been at meetings. I've been at conferences. I've been at camp meetings, youth conferences. And you hear this, that you pull this message out. I'm like, I'm not going to learn anything new. You know, I've heard this one a thousand times. And this is usually a message that is preached to backslidden Christians. Telling a backslider, encouraging a backslider that, hey, the Father will take you back. You know, if you've sinned, go ahead and return to the Father and He will take you with open arms. And you know what? That's true. And I don't think there's anything wrong with taking this passage and preaching that. I think that's fine. I think there's some principles there that we see. I don't think it's inappropriate. But you understand that this passage here, this is one of the safe passages in the Bible. That You know, you'll hear the most liberal church preach on that passage and apply it the way I showed you about a backslider returning to Christ. But that is not the main interpretation of this parable. That is not why Jesus 
told this parable. And when you see what this parable is really all about, you're going to find out this is not one of the safe passages. Okay, I'm going to show you what this parable is really about. And it's something that most preachers would be terrified to preach about and would not preach about. But I'm going to give you plenty of evidence that I'm not just making this stuff up. But this it is. It's one of the most familiar passages of Scripture in the Bible. One of the most famous parables. If you ask people, name a parable. One of the first ones they'd probably mention is the parable of the prodigal son. And But most people don't get the real message. And so this parable, it often causes confusion. Be, and I've heard many people you know, ask questions and they've discussed these things because they get confused about this parable. Because notice he says, this my son, he was lost and is found. So was that saying my son, does that represent he was saved and then got saved? So is this story of the prodigal son, is this a picture of a backslider? Or is it a picture of someone who is lost and gets saved? And people get confused because, well, but wait a minute, you know, because we have the father and the son and he was always the son. Even when he was away on a long journey, he never stopped being the son. This is a picture of a backslider returning to Christ. But no, it says he was lost and is found. And why would we think that that's talking about a lost person getting saved? Because can anybody tell me where else in the Bible it talks about being lost and found and that being a picture of salvation? Well, it's not in the Bible, but it's in Amazing Grace. So it's practically in the Bible, okay? Because everybody knows that song. We've sung it a thousand times. And when you sing Amazing Grace, you're talking about I was lost, meaning I wasn't saved. And then I was found, meaning I got saved. And so people do, they get confused. You know, so, you know, is this for a backslider? Is it for... Someone who's lost and gets saved. It's for neither. That This is not about individuals. That is not what this parable was all about. And this is another reason, too, I say this all the time. You have to be, conf- be very careful forming your doctrine with parables. Very dangerous thing to do. It's real easy to get into some false doctrine when you do that. And so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you kind of what these things represent. And then I'm gonna, we're going to go through it again. And I'm going to show you kind of step by step and uh, as we go verse by verse that uh, what I'm telling you this parable means is in fact what it means. So in this parable, it's very clear that the father represents God. Hey, I don't think anybody would deny that. And then the older brother represents the Jews. The older brother represents the Jews and the younger brother represents the Gentiles. Sinners. Bad people, people who are not seeking after righteousness, but somehow they found it. And I'm going to show you too, that this parable, you know, I've always noticed how it kind of ends abruptly. It just kind of ends in a weird place. And the reason is Jesus ends this parable where they were currently at. And so he didn't tell the full story. And so I'm going to finish this parable for you tonight. I'm not trying to add to the word of God, okay? But I'm going to show you what happened in the rest of this this parable, okay? I'm not not trying to add to the story, but when you see what it represents, it's very clear that this story of the prodigal son and the father and the older brother, that there actually is an ending to this story. And I'm going to show you what that is from the Bible here. So... uh, You know, older brother, the Jews, younger brother, Gentiles, sinners, the father represents God. And so a few things before I interpret this parable that you need to understand, the thing you always have to do whenever you look at a parable, you got to go back and find out why Jesus started telling that parable. And this is how come most Baptists aren't going to get this. Most Baptists, once again, they zero in on single phrases, single verses. Sometimes you got to zoom out a little bit and you got to look at big, sometimes whole chapters. Sometimes you have to look at two or three chapters, okay? And in and, and, uh, chapter 15, where this one starts, in verse 1, look what it says. And it says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. The publicans and sinners wanted to hear Jesus, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Okay, notice what starts this whole thing. The Pharisees, the older brother, got mad about publicans and sinners. I'm going to show you, I believe those are Gentiles. And Jesus 
fellowshipping with them like the father fellowshiped with the son. They killed the fatted calf and he ate with them. And the Pharisees are mad about that. That is what started these parables. And we're not going to read all of it. But then if you go uh, right after that, Jesus gives the parable of the lost sheep. And people have the same problem with that one too. You know, is it a picture of someone getting saved? Is it a picture of a backslider? Mass confusion. We're not going to go through all that one, but it's very clear that what inspired this parable, the Pharisees had a problem with Jesus fellowshipping with sinners. And then in Galatians 2.15, I want to show you that I believe that these sinners were actually Gentiles. Okay, It was the publicans and sinners. Now, why would it call them sinners? Weren't the Jews sinners too? Okay, I mean, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the Jews were sinners too. So were these just bad Jews? Or were they Gentiles? Now listen, they often refer to Gentiles as sinners. I'll show you why here in a minute. But in Galatians 2.15, Paul's writing here, and he says, we also are we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. What's Paul saying here? Jews aren't sinners? Is Paul saying, I'm not a sinner? Listen, a sinner is a transgressor of the law. The Jews, they were at least trying to keep the law. Jesus came, when he came to earth, he showed them that no, you in fact have not kept the law. You're sinners too. But they didn't know that. And a sinner is one who transgresses the law. Well, the Gentiles, they had no law. They didn't follow the laws of God. They didn't care about the laws of God. The Gentiles weren't seeking after righteousness. And so when the Bible would often refer to a group of people as sinners, it's because they were Gentiles. These were people who were not following the Old Testament law in any way, who weren't even trying. And because, you know, so we all know all have sinned. But that's why Paul had to specify that in Romans 3.23, because there were people who didn't think that they were sinners. But he said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Even Jews, that, that uh, rich young ruler that came to Jesus, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? He didn't think he was a sinner. He didn't see that he loved his money more than he loved God, which was the greatest of all sins. And so when it referred to these people here in Luke as sinners, it's talking about Gentiles. All right. And so um, the Pharisees in, uh, in verse 16 of Galatians, he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, we know this now, but the Jews did not know that yet. That's one of the things that Jesus had to do. It's one of the things that John the Baptist tried to teach them, that you guys have not been justified by the law. They thought they were covered. They thought they were good, but they weren't. Those Pharisees and scribes that were murmuring when Jesus was eating with these Pharisees and publicans, they didn't understand that they were sinners too. They were like that older brother who said, I never sinned against you. Father, I've kept all your commandments. I did everything you told me to do. That's what the Pharisees were saying to Jesus. That's what the Pharisees thought about themselves. But it turns out, no, they had not. But that's exactly what they thought. So when you see what inspired this parable, it's very clear what Jesus was trying to get across. And so let's go look at this again. All right, let's read it again with my commentary. But Luke 15, 11, a certain man had two sons throughout the Bible. I've preached on this before. We have seen that principle of the two sons where the older brother ends up being the bad one and the younger brother ends up being the good one. We see that with Cain and Abel. One was about the works. One was about faith. Jacob and Esau. Here, Esau and Jacob. Esau was older than Jacob. You know, Ishmael and Isaac. We constantly see that through the Bible where it ends up being the younger one. Why did God do that? Because it's the natural that comes before the spiritual. It's the earthy that comes before the spiritual. Adam came before Jesus. That which was of flesh came before that which was of the spirit. We see that all throughout the Bible. And it was no mistake when Jesus made the older brother, the, what we would call the good one, and the younger brother, the bad one, but who ends up having fellowship with the father, who ends up, I believe, 
being the one who actually gets saved. And so that is, that's, uh, I've preached whole messages on that before, but that's a certain man had two sons. When you see those two sons in the Bible, always pay attention to the difference between the older one and the younger one. And there's more examples that I could give, but we don't have time to go into those tonight. But verse 12, it says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. That's why we call him the prodigal son. The prodigal means a waster. And that prodigal, he went and he wasted all he had. He wasted his substance. He wasted his father's inheritance. He spent all, and he had nothing left. And let me tell you something. The Gentiles, for thousands of years, they lived wicked, wicked lives, and they never cared about the things of God. I mean, just read the Bible. Read the Old Testament. I mean, the Jews were pretty bad themselves, but the Gentiles were worse than they were. The Gentiles, they didn't care about the things of God. They weren't looking after righteousness. God had to constantly tell the Jews, don't intermarry with those Gentiles because you're going to follow their gods. They're going to corrupt your ways because they were so bad. But look at what it says in Romans chapter 9 in verse 30. It says, what shall we say then that the Gentiles, which follow not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone, and it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay? The Jews, the older brother, sought after righteousness. The Gentiles did not. They wasted their substance. For thousands of years, they never cared one time about the things of God as a people. They lived wicked lives. They're idolatrous people. And yet, somehow, they ended up getting right like the prodigal did. After he's in a hog pen, what did he do? You know what? He, he repented. He got right. You know what? This is ridiculous. I'm going back to the Father. And he had fellowship with the Father. He received forgiveness. And that is that not exactly what God did with the Gentiles? You know, if we could trace our ancestry back, most of us, we'd probably find some barbarians in there. We'd find some idolatrous people in there, some wicked, wicked people in our ancestry. But you know what? Thank God he did a work amongst the Gentiles. And, you know, we're saved today. We're here today. We're kind of a product, I believe, of the Apostle Paul's ministry that was to the Gentiles. God did a work amongst the Gentiles. Why? Because they were that prodigal son that returned, that came back to the Father. And so, and, and the Jews hated that. They struggled with that. Just like the older brother struggled seeing the younger brother come back to the Father. He didn't like it. Verse 14 of Luke 15, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, and he would fain have uh, filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. The Gentiles, I mean, they stooped to some very low places. I mean, when we read the Old Testament, it's mostly about the Jews, but you understand the, some of the horrible things that you see the Jews doing, where'd they get that from? They got it from the Gentiles. They got the Gentiles. I mean, they were a wicked, wicked people and it repulsed the Jews and it, it, they repulsed God too. Look what it says in Matthew 21 verse 28. Here's another parable of two sons. But what think ye? a certain man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward repented and went. And he came to the second and likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not, whither of them twain did the will of his father. They say unto him the first, Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not, but the publicans and harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe. Y'all see that? Jesus is saying, but listen, all these wicked people, 
Listen, yeah, they did some bad stuff, but you know what? They repented and believed. But you all, you all said you obeyed, but then John comes along in the way of righteousness, and you know what? You didn't believe him. You didn't repent. And so you know what? They're going to the kingdom of heaven before you would. Now you would think with that father and his two sons, he's got one son that's doing his best to obey him. He's got another son that wasted everything. You would think the father would favor the older brother, wouldn't you? But that's not what happened. That is not, that is not the case. But that's what the Jews thought. And that's why Jesus is telling them this parable. And so um, in verse 17, it says that when he had came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Notice something here, because I'm talking about the Gentiles here. And they say, well, no, the Gentiles, they were never the children of God. Okay? They, they, were, you know, they were never the sons of God. Okay? And that's where people might want to try to argue with me on this thing. But look, listen, in Luke chapter 3, verse 38, Luke, the same gospel that this parable is in, when it gives the lineage of Christ, it goes all the way back to Adam, doesn't it? which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Okay? He was, Adam was the son of God. He was an earthy son of God. He was a physical son of God. But remember last week, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Even those Old Testament saints, they had to be of faith. They had to become spiritual in order for them to inherit the kingdom of God. But understand, they were the sons of God, but why did they fall? They fell because of sin. And the physical sons of God, they fell. They lost fellowship with the Father because of sin. But understand, they started out sons of God, didn't they? But they got lost. Okay, When man was created, he was created perfect. When Adam was created, he was on his way to heaven. But listen, man sinned, they fell. And he was not on his way to heaven anymore. He fell, he was lost, and physical man throughout history has been wicked. They've all been sinners. They've all been prodigals. They've all wasted their substance. But I believe this prodigal coming back, it is, it's, I think it is a picture of salvation. How can you go from being a son to, you know, being lost and then back to being saved? Because Adam started out saved, but you know what? He fell and mankind fell with him and mankind, physical man, all physical men, including the Jews, in order to be saved, they had to become spiritual. They had to return to Christ. They had to believe on the Lord and so, I don't think there's any contradiction here. And it's clear. And I'm speaking, you know, he's speaking in parables here. But in this parable, it's clear that that prodigal son, he never forgot the father. And the father never forgot the son. And while for thousands of years, God focused his attention on the Jews, you know what? It's clear also in the Old Testament, God never forgot about the Gentiles, did he? God never forgot about him. It's clear in the Old Testament that that Messiah was going to come. To him, the Gentiles would seek that righteous branch. It was clear God had a plan from the beginning, not just to save the Jews, but to save the Gentiles because he never forgot about them. God never forgot about that earthly creation. God made a way of salvation. And you know what? While it appeared all these thousands of years that the Gentiles are living wicked, idolatrous lives, wasting everything. Thank God, as a people, many of them figured out, what am I doing in this hog pen? Let's go back to the Father and we'll be better off there. 
We just got to do, what do we got to do? Lord, I've sinned against heaven and against thee and in thy sight. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. What do we have to do to be saved? We got to acknowledge the fact that we're a sinner. We got to call on the Lord for salvation. And you know what? He gives it to us every time. And that's exactly what the father did for this prodigal. He didn't deserve it one bit. He could have said, you wasted my substance. You had your chance. You threw away your inheritance. But that's not what he did. He accepted him back. And the Gentiles, as wicked as we were, God still took us back. Why? Because he's a merciful God. Just like the father in this story. The father never forgot about that other son. And the son never forgot about that father. And thank God, we, that's why we can go to, I believe, any part of the world and we can take the gospel to people who maybe for generations and generations have never believed on Christ. They've been idolatrous. And I believe we can see revival in those places. Those people can be saved. You know why? Because they are prodigals. And the Lord will take them back if they will realize that and believe on Him. And that's why we got we to gotta spread the gospel wherever we can. These people, some of these nations that are out there, they're wicked. Yeah, they're as wicked as all get out. You know what they are? They're prodigals. But if they would believe on Christ, they could return. And so that's what we, when we see these wicked nations that we just, you know, North Korea, why don't we just nuke them? Trump just nuke them. You know why we don't, we shouldn't nuke them because they're prodigals. Why don't we try to find a way to get the gospel to those people? And then, because if they will believe, they can return and the Father will accept them. Everybody is all ready to bomb all, the, bomb all the Muslim nations. Well, listen, those Muslims, they're a bunch of prodigals. They're wasting their, yeah, they're living wicked lives. They don't deserve to come back to the Father. But you know what? The Father has not forgot them. And He will take them back if they will believe on Him. And that is exactly what God has done for us. There is nothing physically about us that's acceptable to God. Just like there's nothing physically about the Jews that's acceptable to God. They missed that. They didn't see that. But that's what he's trying to get across in this parable. And so, you know, for you know, uh, thousands of years, Gentiles, they wasted their lives. They were evil. God focused all his attention on the Jews during that time. And that whole time, the prodigal, he's out in that far country, wasting everything. You know, the father, he still has a relationship with that older brother, doesn't he? He's focusing all the attention on that older brother. The Jews, they used to be the, that, uh, like that older brother. They got all the attention from God. They were the chosen people. And then all of a sudden, those, that younger brother comes, starts coming back. And the Jews didn't like that. They didn't accept it very well, just like this older brother. And I'm telling you, folks, you can't deny... The, parable of the two sons of the prodigal son it destroys zionism all by itself and i mean i i don't think anybody could say i'm stretching this stuff here i mean i think this is pretty clear what it means especially when we look at the context so god god did god did one miracle after another for the jews all attention was on israel but they constantly did many of the same things the gentiles did look at uh, romans chapter 10 <clears throat> my voice is struggling tonight so verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Would anybody say that it appears that older brother got jealous of the younger brother in that story? God said way back in Moses' day that I'm going to provoke you to jealousy with the foolish nation. I'm going to anger you with them. And in, but in verse 20, but Isaiah, Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all the day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. You all see that right there? Right there, it's, it's showing how it was prophesied way back then. The Lord was going to provoke the Jews to jealousy with a foolish nation, with the Gentiles. 
And he's like, you know, all the day long, I've had my hand stretched forth unto you. I have focused all my attention on you. I have been good to you. I gave you everything, and yet you won't come to me. They thought they were good, but God said, no, you're not good. But the Gentiles, they got it. And everybody agrees that that's what that passage is talking about. It's clear as all get out. Right there in Romans, Paul is, he is referring to Old Testament scriptures from Deuteronomy, I believe, and uh, from Isaiah, showing that this, God has had this plan all along. Gentiles were not plan B. We're plan A. From the very beginning, God had this, God had this plan. And so, just like the older brother was jealous of the younger brother, Israel was jealous of the Gentiles. And all those centuries of rejection was because men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. All those years, the Gentiles were rejecting. Okay? Their deeds were evil. They, they didn't want to come to the light lest their deeds would be reproved. And they didn't. For thousands of years, you don't ever see any... It, it, you, you see individuals in the Old Testament. We see small revivals amongst Gentiles. But anything on any large scale, you just you don't see it with the Gentiles. Why? They didn't care. They weren't looking for it. And yet, eventually they got it. And the Jews who got all the attention, that older brother that got all the attention, didn't get it. And so, uh, let's re- look at verse 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. The Gentiles repented, while the Jews, they never acknowledged any wrongdoing. Look at Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. And he spake this parable unto them, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. We all know this parable too. This is another one of these safe passages that even a liberal church will preach from this passage. But understand what this passage is really talking about, the primary application to this passage. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous, despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not so much as lift, uh, so much as, uh, lift so much as eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Is that not exactly what the prodigal son did? I'm not worthy to be called your son. But what did the older brother do? The older brother came and said, I never sinned against you. You never gave me a fatted calf. What did he do? He proclaimed his righteousness. He exalted himself. Just like that Pharisee, the prodigal, just like the publican, he humbled himself. And who went justified in that? It was the publican. And who was it that got justified? It was the Gentiles who believed, not the Jews. And that... That's what Luke 18 is all about too, folks. Okay, we like to use it about us. You, you pious Baptists that think you're something. You're like that Pharisee. And you know what? That's fine. You, we can apply that. That application is appropriate. That's a principle we can look at that's appropriate. But that was not the main application of that parable. That is talking about the Jews and the way they looked at the Gentiles. And that's Jesus saying the Gentiles are going to get saved before you do. I mean, just more proof what this is all about. I'm telling you, Baptists have got to stop with this zeroing in on one little verse, and they've got to learn to look at context. Sometimes they need to do a little more than one chapter in their Bible reading. You know, you've got to do a few chapters at once sometimes to see the big picture. And so, uh, verse 22, But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. We today, we descend from a lost, fallen people. But God has blessed us greatly, has He not? I mean, look at, 
Look at our nation. Look at even America compared to the Holy Land. You know, the, the Holy Land, they don't have any religious freedom there. You're not even allowed to pass out tracts. You're not allowed to evangelize in the Holy Land. That place is as wicked as all get out. An America that's full of Gentiles, I mean, a melting pot of people all over the world, God has blessed this nation. Why? Because there's a lot of Christians in this nation. Obviously not like it used to be, but there are still a lot of saved people here, and God has blessed us greatly. We're safer here today than they are in Israel. I mean, I would so much rather live here than live in Israel. I mean, look at how God has blessed us. We're partying. Compared to what the old, older brother, you know, the older brother, he's out working the fields. He's out working for his salvation. He's out working, trying to impress the father. We're the prodigals. What did we do? We humbled ourselves. We just admitted to the father that we're sinful. And here we are fellowshipping with the father today. We're being blessed by God. We're eating of the fatted calf. And those Jews, those, they're miserable. I mean, Jews are some of the meanest people. They've got nasty attitudes. You know why? Because they're miserable. They don't have God. And we do. And here we are, I mean, living the party, and they hate it. And the old, that older brother, he hated it. He was mad, but God has blessed us. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Paul quoted this passage too. Elect, precious, he that believeth on him shall not be confounded, Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, them which be disobedient. Who is that? Well, it says the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Whoa, look at that. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal, a royal priesthood and holy nation of peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. This is crystal clear here. Peter's talking to Gentiles. And what's he saying? He's saying they, the Jews, who were disobedient. They who were disobedient. They were the disobedient ones. Why? Because they never repented. They never admitted that they were sinners. And he, and he quotes that passage that throughout the New Testament is quoted, applying it to the Jews. They stumbled at that stumbling stone, that rock of offense. But you, you people who weren't a nation, who weren't a people, you're the chosen generation. You're the holy nation. You are the royal priesthood. I mean, that, hey, folks, it doesn't get any clearer than that either right there. The same thing... And so, right, we see that in that story of the prodigal son. Here he is having fellowship with the father. I mean, he, he'd he got the ring. He got the robe. He's right back where he started. He's son of, son of the father. He's got his position. And that brother wasn't about to share that. That brother wasn't interested in that one bit. But it said, uh, but, um, Look at verse, oh, I lost my spot. Verse 25. Now the elder son was in the field and he came and drew nigh to the house. He heard music and dancing. A lot of times when people tell the story of the prodigal, they quit before they get to this part. He heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, thy brother is come and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. The Jews, they did not like the fact the Gentiles were being saved, even in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 11, verse 1, this is after the story of Cornelius, where Cornelius gets saved. He's a Gentile. He's from Italy. He gets the gift of the Holy Ghost. And in chapter 11, the Jews are trying to figure out what to do because Gentiles are being saved. And it says in verse 1, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. What's going on here? It sounds like the Jews had a problem with Gentiles fellowshipping 
with the Father. They didn't like it. Sounds kind of familiar. Sounds like, just like that older brother, doesn't it? It's the exact same thing. They didn't like it. And, it, and so they were, the, in the book of Acts, it was constantly a problem where the Jews were having problems with the Gentiles and they were constantly fighting Judaizers who were coming in and trying to add the works of the law and make them a part of salvation. Because they just couldn't handle it that these Gentiles who were as wicked as all get out were going to get to go to heaven just because they believed on Christ. Man, we've been good our whole lives. And you know, now, yeah, we some of us, we've realized that Jesus is the way to heaven. We believed on him, but man, we've never done the things those people did. We never worshiped idols. You know, we never fornicated. We never did all those horrible things that they've done. And yet they're getting saved. That's not fair. Why should they who wasted their inheritance share in our inheritance? Because remember what it said in the beginning of that story of the prodigal. He said, give me the portion of goods that cometh to me. He received his inheritance and he wasted it. He came back with nothing, didn't he? But yet he's received his position back. So what does that mean for the older brother's inheritance? What, you know, what does that mean? And I'll, I'll show you here in a little bit. But verse 29, he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make marry with my friends. Boy, he was a perfect son, wasn't he? That's what the Jews thought about themselves. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Jealous of that younger brother. Just like was prophesied in Deuteronomy 32, 21, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. The Jews did that to God. So you know what God said? And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Y'all see that? Turns out this older brother, he wasn't as much of an angel as he pretended to be. And the Jews weren't as much of angels as they pretended to be. And God provoked them to anger with a foolish nation. It's called the Gentiles. I mean, boy, this fits so perfectly. Folks, you can't make this up. I don't see, I don't, I don't think I'm twisting anything. I'm not trying to stuff a square peg into a round hole here. It fits like a glove. And you know what? In verse 31, look at what he says. And he said to him, son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. He's talking there to the Jews. Cause listen, God had been good to the Jews. Had he not? I mean, unto them were committed the oracles of God. God did miracle after miracle for them. Even though they kept rejecting him, he would save them out of their troubles over and over again. And finally, he sent his son to die for them. Had God not been good to the Jews? Was salvation only offered to the Gentiles or was it offered to the Jews and the Gentiles? It was offered to both. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And understand the full rejection has not happened yet from the Jews to Jesus Christ. They were on their way to it. We all know the end of the story, but they weren't there yet. At this point where Jesus is at, everything, they ha everything we have, the Jews could have had, and they could still have if they get saved. And that's what he's saying here. All that I, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. God had been good. But verse 32, <clears throat> it was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this. Thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And then that's the end. He ends the story right there. Well, wait, so, so what the brother, what the older brother say after that? Did he ever make up with his younger brother? Did he stay mad at his father? What about his inheritance? The prodigal already wasted all his. Are you going to have to share what happened in this story? All right. Don't you hate when shows end and they don't finish the story, you know, to be continued. Ah, come on. What happened? In this story, what's the end? This is not that this is not an ending right here, folks. Jesus takes the story up to where they were currently at. They had not fully rejected yet. And it ends in a strange way because the story wasn't over. And so notice how the father told him all that I have is thine. The same gift of salvation, the same fellowship, the Holy Spirit, 
everything that we have received was offered to the Jews, but they rejected it. And so the end of this parable, you know, that Jesus, you know, the, the end of the parable that Jesus didn't share, I believe this is what I believe happened in that story. When the father told him, Hey, he's back. He's a part of the family. He's sharing your inheritance. And you know what he said? I refuse to share. And you know what he did? He rejected his inheritance and he walked away from it. He hated his younger brother that much. He thought he was that, he thought he was that righteous. He said, forget it, father, give it all to him. I'm gone. And he left. That's what, that's what I believe happened. He was not willing to share it with that younger brother. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12. Let me show you a few more scriptures. Are you adding to the Word of God, Pastor Tommy? No, I'm not trying to add to the Word of God, but folks, that's exactly what happened. That is exactly what happened. The Jews rejected the Messiah. They did not want to share with the Gentiles. The Jews thought the Messiah was going to come and set up an earthly kingdom right then. But no, they found out, wait, I've got my younger son or, that I'm going to get first. I'm going to get those Gentiles first. You all are going to have to share the inheritance with the younger son. And they said, no, we're not sharing with those Gentiles. We're not going to do that. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, that at the time ye were without Christ, this is talking to us, the prodigals, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one. Now these people that still want to make something for the physical nation of Israel, no, the kingdom is theirs. No, God made both one. Who do they think this both is he's talking about? It's talking about Israel and the Gentiles, but believing Israel and the Gentiles. He's made us both one. There is no Jew and Greek anymore. And there never will be again. We used to be, he's made both one. Um, I lost my spot. Yeah, and it's broken down the middle wall partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God. In one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were far off, and to them that were nigh. You who are far off, the Gentiles, the prodigals, the ones who are in the far country, and the older brother too, the one who is nigh, the one who is close, the Jews. He preached both to you. The same gospel was preached to both people. But you know what? As you know, some Jews got it, but as a whole, the Jews, the older brother, they rejected it. And so, well, which so which Jews made it, which ones didn't? Those who were Jews spiritually got it. Those who were believers. All those ones who are believers, they received inheritance, but all of the physical ones, they went to hell. And all physical Jews who never are born again will go to hell. Why? Because they are the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction that we see mentioned in Romans and that was mentioned, I forgot that pastor it says, whereunto they were appointed. Listen, it is appointed for those who are of the flesh to go to hell. And yes, physical Jews they are destined for hell unless they're born again. But understand, many of them are rejecting and still reject today. What are they, they, they call us goyim. You know, they don't like us. They still think about Gentiles the way they did back then. They're not willing to share in the inheritance with the younger brother. And so, you know what? They get nothing. They walked away. They lost their inheritance. You know, they, they did. They turned their back on it. And I believe so I understand that was a parable that Jesus told, but if he would have told them the end of the story, it would have been something along those lines. The older brother got mad, said, forget my inheritance, give it to the younger brother, I'm out of here. And he lost it. Now, any Jew that would like to get back in on that inheritance, they could get it if they'll get born again. But as a whole, you know, they're not coming back. 
Because flesh and blood can't enter the kingdom of God. It's just not, it's not going to happen. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. Last passage I want to show you. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. Look at what it says here too. Because it said, people did, it's still trying to make something for the Jews in the future. But look what it says in verse 7. Unto the angel of the church of Phil- in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Y'all see that right there? The synagogue of Satan, there's no doubt that's talking about the Jews, physically speaking. And he said, I am going to make them of the synagogue of Satan. I'm going to make them to come and worship before thy feet. We've got some of these guys that are still out there teaching that the kingdom is for the Jews, and we're basically, we're basically going to serve the Jews in the kingdom. God said, I'm going to make them of the synagogue of Satan bow before your feet. I'm going to make sure they know that I loved you. I'm going to prove that they don't believe it. The Jews still don't believe it today. I mean, even the Ruckmanites act like God loves the Jews more than he loves us today. And he's going to in the future. But you know what? God said the total opposite. Jesus said the total opposite in Revelation chapter 3. Why? Because we're the younger brother. And you know what did we do? We were bad. We were bad sinners. We wasted everything, but we repented. We admitted we were wrong. The Jews who were following after righteousness, but still didn't make it themselves either. They never repented. They never got right. And they hate, they hated the younger brother. Just like Cain hated Abel. Just like Ishmael hated Isaac. Just like Esau hated Jacob. The Jews still hate us today. Because we're the younger brother. We're partying with the father. We have fellowship with the father. They don't. And they have rejected their inheritance. They despise their birthright. And you know what? That, folks, is what the safe passage of the prodigal son that any liberal church will preach on. That is what that parable is really all about. And I'd like to see Joel Osteen preach on that one. I'll send him my outline and I'll let him take full credit for it. But you'll never hear, you'll never hear that preached on one of these TV preacher shows. You won't even hear that preached to most mainstream Baptist churches, even though it's as clear as all get out, because that's not safe. That's, you know, that's not politically correct. You know, that's not, uh, that doesn't go along with the college textbooks. But folks, I think we have plenty of Bible right there. So that's what the parable of the two sons is all about. So with that, let's all stand together.